I don't know what I'm going to do. 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 I don't it gives me it gives me great pleasure to introduce. Uh, if y'all followed us at all, we have our our third member, our third wheel is uh, Sean Weiss. Um, he's not here um, because he is the third wheel. Uh, I didn't mean to introduce he's not here, but it's it's a great pleasure to have Eric. Uh, Jean Marie came, but it's great to have Eric here, and you guys will uh, have fun with this one for sure. So Eric, I'll turn it over to you, man. Thanks. How about it, brother? So I heard Ashley in the hallway that lunch is at noon, and someone said it was a box lunch. So I'm happy to talk until 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon, give you guys a chance to order some food and see where we're going to go. Um, I was, so coming here, I, was, I had a hard time finding what I was going to pack because it's an in-person, right? Everybody's been doing the business mullet, right? Business on top, and then your, your PJs on the bottom. So I had a very hard time. I'm not sure if it all matches, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it does. I labored, I labored for a while, and my shift supervisor, also known as the person I share a pillow with, also known as Jean Marie Loria, um, she was no help, so um, but that's fine. So for the next uh, two or three hours, we're going to talk about OIG stuff. Um, I am a retired agent from HHS OIG. For those of you that may not be intimately familiar with that, HHS is U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And they're the umbrella agency of about 300 different programs. Um, uh, among them, which people know mostly, is CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, and that's going to be Medicare and Medicaid payments and the like. The OIG is one, uh, HHS OIG is one of about 72 or so federal OIG agencies. Um, and there's different components that make up uh, what OIGs are. Uh, but their general rule is uh, combating uh, waste, fraud, and abuse within the programs that they oversee. And so every cabinet level uh, secretary has, there's an OIG because there's money that goes out. And you've got even very tiny organizations. So for those of you that have never heard of the National Archives but watch the news, now you're hearing about the National Archives. Like they have probably like two agents that work for them, very, very tiny. HHS OIG is the largest. I think currently now they're up uh, over four or 500 agents, which still is not enough considering the amount of fraud that, that goes on. Um, there are a number of components that make up HHS OIG. The ones that you probably spend a lot of time thinking about and reading about uh, our uh, Office of Audit Services and Office of Evaluation and Inspection, which are the organizations that follow most closely the OIG work plan. Everybody loves to talk about the work plan. I worked at the Office of Investigations, which meant that I was a criminal investigator as a special agent with the badge and the gun. So the Office of Investigations were the criminal investigators, the badges and the guns. Office of Audit Services are the accountants. And Office of Evaluation and Inspection primarily are doing empirical studies. Like, for example, there's a study that just came out today um, on telehealth for the past uh, year and a half or so. And it, they did some empirical studies on um, risks of fraud uh, as it results from that. They identified something like 17 or 1,800 providers who they think are at uh, at higher risk of perpetuating fraud. So OIG agents, same job description, category, same everything as anybody who's in the traditional three-letter organizations, FBI, DEA, ATF, same training, same everything. I just had a badge that said HHS on it, and so my focus was on, was on healthcare. Um, I retired in January of 2019. I got recruited by um, Jean Marie, who essentially told me it was time to stop working at the OIG and to come work for her. And so I do what I'm told, and uh, I came to work for her, Jean Marie. Uh, and I've been at Advice for about four years. And I oversee primarily on the provider side. 
uh, of the work that we do. Advice does a ton of stuff, but I work primarily on the provider side, proactive things, self-disclosures, and the like. Uh, a lot of work in the pharma, and there's a lot of pharma at this conference, a lot of stuff involving coupon and co-pays, and all of the naughty things that happen as a result of uh, government payers, the charities, and, and the like. So we're going to spend the next uh, hour, really, a little bit less, and we're going to just talk about, like, Behind the curtain, right? It's the big curtain of Oz. What happens? How do cases get to the OIG? What are some of the things that OIG looks at? Um, and then just some general considerations that you can take back to the workplace with respect to kind of common sense approaches to um, compliance and the like. And like, what should you do when the OIG shows up? Because the OIG shows up in a lot of different ways. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. I always say that the best job that I ever had was working as an OIG agent until I retired and came to work for Advise because that's what I'm told to say. So I mean, so I will, I will, I will say it. But I really did have. I had a great time um, when I was an OIG agent. Jordan, thanks for coming. That piece of crap. Yeah. Let's see. No, none of this is working. <laughs> oh wait, let's see. Maybe it'll work now. Probably would. Let me see here. You should let me push buttons. I'm like, what does this button do? Hold on. This could work now. Oh, hold on. Here yeah, we go. Hold on. Hold on. Hold that thought. How many chuckleheads of the tape tape? I, I. There we go. Let's see if it actually works. Out. That's what I want to know. Oh, all right. Yeah, there we go. We are in the win. We in the win. All right. So this was uh, this was it's my last time being able to qualify as an agent. Um, you can see I've actually gotten younger as a result because my beard is gone; it's no longer gray. But you know, I always say that, that it, it really is. As a law enforcement officer, I had a badge, I had a gun, I did all the things that people do in law enforcement. And people oftentimes wonder why why is it that as an agent at the OIG and I'm dealing with doctors, why do I need to have a gun? Um, because at the end of the day, when you're looking to take someone's liberty, you're doing a search warrant, you're arresting them for for crimes that they've allegedly committed. Um, people do crazy things, and it's not just doctors anymore, right? So you've got corporate practice of medicine, you've got DME suppliers, most of them are nefarious to begin with, um, and then you've just got, you've got a group of people who become wayward, and um, the, you know, I'm not going to bore you with war stories, so I think that's nonsense to do, but I will say that my gun has come out of the holster on multiple occasions during arrests and search warrants. Um, and it was, you know, we've, I've had instances where I worked where I was really kind of surprised at the fact that somebody didn't want to come with me when I told them they were under arrest. Um, and they were, you know, three and four million dollar a year doctors. So strange things happen. Um, but so I retired and then I moved into the world of consulting, which is a vastly different world. Uh, spending most of my time sitting around on the phone listening to Jean Marie pontificate about how I don't speak to clients the right way, um, which is which is a true story. I worked as a my whole adult working life. I was an agent of the government. That was it. And then I come into consulting and everything that people say, you're right. Yes, we can do that. It's bullshit. We can't always do it, right? So so this is, you know, I'm sitting on these calls. It's yes, yeah, we can, yes, whatever. You, no, no, you didn't commit fraud. It was just a billing error. It was an anomaly. Um, so... All right, so what are we talking about? We're talking about how OIG initiates an investigation, where cases come from. Everybody always wonders where cases come from. Cases come from a lot of sources. We'll talk about that. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the investigative considerations because there are way more cases than there are people to investigate them. You could never have enough bodies to work on the cases. Um, and so we're going to talk a little about what some of those investigative considerations are. We're going to talk about a little bit of that alphabet soup that you probably all know about, the max, the U picks, the medic, but we'll talk about what some of their defined roles are because um, there's a lot of overlap in them and I think there are some misnomers about what um, the U picks do and we'll talk a little bit about what they are. Um, and then we're going to talk about some, some compliance issues. Really, these are not so much about if you're a compliance officer and implementing things like we're not going to talk about the OIG's um, seven-point model compliance guide. We're going to talk about like common sense when the OIG shows up with a subpoena or a search warrant, like what do you do? 
Uh, but first, I am a New Yorker. My accent is uh, not as bad as it could be. Um, and so it is important. I always like to say, as a New Yorker, uh, I spent my career working in New York and New Jersey, but I lived in New Jersey. So although New York is a great place, we did, in fact, have the greatness of New Jersey and the Jersey Shore and the, and the knuckleheads. Anybody from New Jersey? Yeah, great. So, you know, we're, a lot of, we're amongst a lot of idiots, right? It's a lot of stupid people. And so you kind of have to meld the stupid with the smart. Um, but of course... Split my time now since I retired. I split my time between New Jersey and uh, Florida. And Florida's got its own host of issues. Um, I think I live at the line of demarcation, Orlando. Anybody from Florida? So you know, right? We have a lot of stupid people as well. Well, 100% right. So, so by the way, if you have not been on the website, floridaman.com, it is a real thing. Go on the website, read it, and you will, just when you think you've hit rock bottom, go to floridaman.com. Someone will have a shovel. They'll start digging because you have not hit rock bottom. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about uh, cases and sort of how they come into to play. So cases come to the OIG from a lot of different places. Um, a lot of it is proactive, a lot of it is reactive. So when we talk about reactive, we're talking about information that comes to the OIG. So a big one right now are relators, whistleblowers. Those of you in the pharma industry, you're intimately familiar with whistleblowers and relators. If you work in the device industry, you're intimately familiar with them because this is where the money is, right? We rob banks because that's where the money is. Whistleblowers file key tams because that's where the money is. The malfeasance is pretty prevalent, unfortunately, and as you see, there are some companies that just continue to have to go back to the well. So there are some pharma companies that have had two and three cases against them. Now, oftentimes, you'll see that a lot of the behavior is behavior that you would say, well, why aren't these guys being excluded? Why aren't they being criminally prosecuted? So from the exclusion perspective, you can only exclude mandatorily on a criminal conviction. And that's typically a mandatory of a minimum of five years. But if you have a civil case, you can be what's called permissibly excluded for a minimum of three years. But if you think about it in the device and the medical manufacturing industry, it's very hard to exclude a company like a Pfizer, right? Because they actually make medicine that keep people alive. And so if you exclude them, you've now removed a huge chunk of what that uh, healthcare economy is going to be. So, um, so you'll never really see, even on a criminal prosecution of a corporation, which happens very infrequently, that there'll be a waiver of exclusion, which you can actually get from the OIG, even if you're criminally prosecuted for something, if you happen to be in like an underserved area. For example, if you're the only urologist in a 500 mile radius and you've committed a crime, you can be criminally prosecuted. You know, if you don't go to jail for it, it's a very good chance that you will get a carve out and not be excluded because you're in an underserved area. Um, and so that's the balance of that. HHS TIPS, which is known as the hotline, is run by the Office of Investigations. That's where the analysts are. You can get those complaints in. They'll take them on the phone. They'll take them via web. I will tell you that every single complaint that comes into the OIG gets looked at and gets vetted. Now, the level of vetting could be very minimal. If it's an anonymous complaint that's typically of generalized information, that vetting is going to be very different than a complaint that's got some salient information that could be actionable. But every single complaint that comes to the OIG gets at least a topical vetting. Um, and if there's something there where they think that it should be reviewed more thoroughly, it'll get routed up to the region where, uh, where the agents are located that would handle that area. So, you know, when I was in New Jersey, I would be the duty agent. And sometimes I would get five, six hotline complaints a day. Sometimes you get none. But every single one of them gets reviewed, which I think is something that people don't, they think that they don't get looked at, they think they get thrown into the, into the garbage, but they actually do get looked at. 1-800-MEDICARE, which isn't really a complaint line, that's the CMS line, but if someone were to call and make a complaint, they would get routed over and, and they would get the complaint, we get forwarded over to the, to the hotline. 
Uh, Mail, I just was uh, on a panel last week, and I sat, uh, I moderated a panel, and the agent in charge of the Miami Regional Office was on the panel. I mentored him. I'm uh, very proud of what he's become. And I had a side conversation with him where I talked a little bit. And I was like, when was the last time? And I said, I'm coming out to do this presentation. Uh, when was the last time you guys got a mailing complaint? And it's been years. Like, they just don't have it anymore. But it's possible that someone can mail a complaint. Complaints come into the hotline uh, by mail. Older people who aren't technologically savvy might still use snail mail. Um, telephone calls directly to OIG offices. Most of the OIG offices, the main offices, the phone numbers, all that is published on the web so people can call in. Um, I worked, when I worked in New York, I worked at the regional office, um, which is where all the management for the region would be. And then I moved to an office in New Jersey and our, the phones never rang because it wasn't a published. If you didn't know that we were in the space, you would have known that we were there. Uh, Walk-ins, which are really rare, but I, I, when I was in New York, you would find people would come with a shopping bag full of their documents, and they would just show up, and then you'd have to sit and have a conversation with them about what it was that they were alleging as the fraud. So that that's kind of gone to the wayside with technology during COVID. The offices were closed, so that wasn't really happening. But you know, there's nothing to say that people couldn't do that. The big, uh, another big source of these referrals is the partnerships that go on. So the, the HHS OIG is the primary law enforcement agency for government payer program fraud, Medicare and Medicaid in particular, commercial uh, healthcare fraud uh, that is not HHS's hook. That's uh, the FBI. Um, I, I will say the FBI are healthcare fraud dabblers because the OIG is the primary agency that deals with them. And so you have people that are in different groups at the FBI that will do that. But you know, generally speaking, when people go to the FBI, they don't go to the FBI and say, I want to fight healthcare fraud, right? <laughs> and so most of the people that go into the healthcare fraud units don't typically stay. I did not work a lot with the FBI because it was a constant revolving door of people. And so I didn't feel like I needed to play Groundhog Day. Uh, and so if there was an agent that stuck around, I would work with them. Um, but you get referrals come in from, from commercial insurance carriers, right? The blues of the world all have SIUs, the BUCAs, they all have SIUs, and you kind of work hand in hand with them. You pick in the medic, that's their job. Their job is program integrity. They're the SIU of the Medicare world. And so their job is to actually put together referrals, right? They don't just do pre and post pay. Yeah. Can you um, explain your initials there that you did? I'm going to get there. Okay. We're going to talk about it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. We're going to we're going to get to what all those acronyms are. The office suit. So, um, but they are the benefit integrity groups for for the Medicare program, and they are the ones that filter the cases to the OIG for investigation. The biggest thing right now is proactive data analytics. So, if you go to any of these healthcare fraud conferences, the uh, vendor area is chock full of data analytics companies. Everybody is building a better mousetrap. Right, but there's only so many ways to parse the data. It's really about how does the data look? What are the what are the reactive things you're going to be getting out of that? What's your feedback on the data? But proactive data analytics are really the driving force. Billions of claims are processed a year. It's impossible to look at the data, so you have to do it in an electronic format. Now, you know, we we do these press releases. The U.S. Attorney's Office does press releases all the time. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn. Um, I probably post a few times a day where I talk about a press release. What I don't like to do is I don't like to take a cut and paste. I could read the press release myself. I like to put a couple of paragraphs together. When uh, Jordan and Sean and I do our podcast, we talk a lot about what's going on in the world uh, as a result. And the one thing that everybody, when you read these press releases and you look, Everybody says, why didn't the data pick this up? And I've been asking that question. I asked that question for going on 26 or 27 years now because it's true. Like, why is it that when a, um, when a provider of durable medical equipment is in Florida and the patient's in California and the doctor writing the prescription is in New York, how is it that that's not being caught when there's been no office visit, virtual or otherwise, between the provider and the patient? It's the $64,000 question. Um, but the analytics are getting better. There are things now called geofencing and geospacing, where you can say anything that's in a zip code greater than 50 miles from the patient's address or something like that. And so it's getting better. But proactive data analytics rely on outliers meaning are you an outlier to your peers, which have some inherent 
uh, false positives and false negatives, right? So ophthalmologists are looked at as ophthalmologists, but if you're a retinal specialist, you are going to be a skew of other ophthalmologists because you're using a set of codes that other doctors aren't using. So that's a false positive that needs to be vetted. So you need to understand that. The Healthcare Fraud Prevention Partnership, which is known as HFPP, it's really an industry-related thing. It's a well-funded program from CMS, uh, and it is a contract that is being administered right now. General Dynamics has the contract, and it's a consortium where they get uh, healthcare payers to come together and they try to convince them to submit their de-identified data and they run these aggregate studies because if you are a provider who doesn't show up as an outlier in one insurance plan, you may be an outlier in the aggregate, right? You see this a lot in the pharmacy space when the pharmacy benefit managers go out and do an audit. One of the things that's uh, a standard in a pharmacy audit is inventory reconciliation. Well, if you're CVS and you want to look at the inventory for a pharmacy from January 1st to January 31st, and the uh, CVS comes in and says, hey, you, you guys build us for 1,000 aspirin. Uh, we need to see the inventory records for 1,000 aspirin. And they show them inventory records. We had 1,000 aspirin. CVS Caremark says, okay, great, and they check the box. If a week later, uh, Express Scripts comes in and says, hey, you build us for 1,000 aspirin January 1st to January 31st, show us the inventory records. And the pharmacy gives them the inventory records. Express Scripts says, ah, you have 1,000, great, you're good, right? But it's really not good. And the problem is that there's a lack of aggregation of data in the sense that nobody talks to each other. When I was an OIG agent, we would see that because we would get all the billing data, the Part D, the commercial, and we would see that. But because of the way that it's set up, you don't really see it. The HFPP works to do that in a de-identified way to be able to show that somebody who may not be an outlier by themselves are an outlier in the aggregate. And then the last one is cooperating witnesses and sources, which are known as, in some cases, human confidential sources. You're starting to hear that phrase or versions of that phrase a lot with respect to the Mara Largo search warrants that were done, where they talked about human intelligence and human sources. Confidential informants and witnesses are a key part of any criminal investigation. Basically, the street language for that snitch, right? So oftentimes it's a healthcare provider who's gotten themselves caught for something and are trying to work themselves out of it being as bad as it is. And there's a whole bunch of things that happen on the back end with respect to sentencing and the adjudication of a defendant in a criminal case. But cooperating witnesses and sources are always going to be a very important part of any investigation because they are the insiders, right? If you're talking about, for example, a bribery or a kickback case, a violation of the federal anti-kickback statute or some of the other related statutes, in order for a good kickback case to be resolved, someone has to tell on themselves, right? Because it, you know the only secret that's kept amongst two people is if one is dead or the other one's a cooperator, right? So somebody has to be able to tell the story, whether it be the exchange of cash behind a closed door or the masking of a kickback payment as something like a rental agreement um, or, a, uh, or a sham business arrangement or something like that. <clears throat> so hotlines, hotline complaints that come in, they're still a major source of information. I talked to my friend from Miami the other day, said so they, uh, they get hundreds of them a month. Now they're in Miami. Miami's the largest regional office. There are 70 agents just in Miami alone, um, not including, maybe a little bit more, not including some of the other offices. The Miami region is just Miami, Tampa, and uh, Jacksonville. And they have a small little satellite in Orlando with a couple of people. Um, but the importance of a good complaint is one that has granular levels of detail. Now, this, is, this was actually a case that I worked on. This is a complaint that came in. It was a social worker at a senior citizens building. Uh, a couple of guys came in. Uh, with a doctor, and they were doing uh, free balance testing and screening. What it really what they were doing was they were billing for the highest level uh, home visit, and all, and every single one of these people that lived in the building were all Medicare beneficiaries. So you know they all have doctors, and all the doctor that was sitting there doing was saying, "Well, what medicine do you take?" 
and um, are you eating well, and let's take your blood pressure, and they built for 60-minute office uh, home visits on this. Um, the two guys that owned the company were prosecuted. They had, a, and two doctors were prosecuted for the fraud. Um, they really, they, it was an entirely sham business. They just did nothing. And they paid the doctors $25 per visit to, to write up the notes. So hotline complaints can lead to very good cases. So obviously when we were talking about data a couple of, a couple of seconds ago, the importance of data, and the screen isn't showing this real well, but the importance of data is to understand that in the, you have to be able to look at data to understand where the fraud is. It's impossible to be able to look at claims on the granular level. Now this is from October of 2020, but in October of 2020, there were a total of 60, almost 63 million, you see at the bottom right hand corner there, almost 63 million Americans were on a, in a Medicare program, whether it be traditional Medicare, the red, white, and blue card, or a Medicare Advantage plan, which is like an HMO. So you have almost 63 million people that were enrolled in, in the program. Uh, Florida has something like 10 or 11 million people. It's not showing up well on the slide, but so when you've got that kind of volume, of people in the program, you're also thinking about like how many claims are those people generating, right? It's a lot. And you can't do that. Um, you can't look at things. Uh, the human eye can't spend the time to look at those things. So that's why um, using data analytics works. And the same thing in Part D. So in Part D, in that same time period, it was almost it was almost 48 billion people were in a prescription drug plan. And so you've got a lot of data. You have to be able to match that data. Traditional Medicare, which is known as A and B. So the easiest way to describe it, for those that don't know, is A is buildings. Things that happen in buildings, right? So it's, it's hospital services, nursing home services, home health services, and part B are the people that do the services, right? That's the easiest way to describe it. And so you've got instances where you've got this cross match where a service is rendered and there could be a part A implication, it could be a part B implication, it could be uh, a part D implication. Now I'm gonna actually show you an example a little bit of how that, uh, how that data aggregation works. But it's really always about data. And so for, for people that are on the provider side, one of the things that you always have to consider, and it's one of the things that the OIG considers, it's always data. The OIG, and I say this to the provider clients that we have, if the OIG is looking at your data, why aren't you looking at your data? Right? I mean, that's the simplest thing in the world. It's like, you know, if you're not going to look at your own data, uh, you're missing either, you know, opportunities to both preserve your revenue and generate revenue, right? If you're billing for something that you shouldn't be billing for, someone's going to come and take it at some point. It's not about if you're going to get audited or investigated. It's really when, right? Because, you know, if you flip the coin, it's a 50% chance one of those are going to happen. So it's about... It's about preserving the revenue that you've got by billing and coding and documenting properly, but it's also about generating revenue. So when I was an OIG agent, and we'll talk a little bit about the UPIX, we would get these reports for investigation that would come where they did a review of a provider's records, and they found all these instances of upcoding. And I would always go back to the investigator from the UPIC or the, whoever did the review, and I would say, well, did they undercode a claim? Right? Meaning, did they underbill? And well, we didn't look at that. And so when I came to advise, one of the first things I thought was, well, that's nonsense, right? Because people are being punitively held accountable for things, but they aren't being rewarded on the other end. So it's important that when you're looking at data, it's got to work both ways. You can't just continually poke the bear and say, you overbilled for this and not give you credit for the stuff that you underbill, right? There's a, there's a balance that has to come into play. I'm working on a self-disclosure right now where I have an urgent care center who is upcoding pretty substantially. Um, they were upcoding pretty substantially during the PHE, but they also undercoded a whole bunch of stuff. And so in the self-disclosure, we're doing this whole analysis of the fact that they overbilled, but they also underbilled, so the amount that they actually owe isn't as bad as it looks because you have to give credit for these things. So it's very important that in any investigation that's going on, it's always about the data. And so it's, and it's always about trending data. It's never about what you did today or what you did yesterday. It's sort of, you know, over time, what has happened. That's a revenue cycle issue, and I don't deal with revenue cycle, but, you know, if you're a provider and you're working in, in you know, your practice, 
don't you want to know where your money is coming from? And don't you want to know where your money could potentially be going? Right? I mean, you know, when I look and I see our monthly bills, I want to know how much should I have to pay my landscaper this month? Is it worth keeping my landscaper? How much should I pay for the pool? Is it worth keeping the person that does the pool? And then the answer is, I'm lazy. I don't want to mow. And I, and I grew up in New York City, and I never had a pool. So I have no idea what goes in the pool other than my body. And so I have no interest in those things. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't understand, right? You have to understand this. And so, you know, from a financial perspective, it should be no different. So it's trends in your billings. It's trends as a, as a specialty. If you're a specialist and you get a new piece of technology, that's going to make you an outlier because now you're using a piece of technology you never used before. Now, that doesn't mean that being an outlier is a bad thing. I think that that's a term that people tend to use, that if you're an outlier, it's bad. It's not bad. You can be an outlier, but you can be an outlier for a legitimate purpose that's articulable and has a rationale behind it. So you have to understand this. If you're a doc that's now starting to prescribe a drug that you didn't prescribe before, why are you doing it? Is it a new drug? Is it a drug that's gone generic and you actually want your patients to get a different version because it's generic? You know, we see this in the opioid world, right? So you have the Appalachian area. There's a special task force that was created. They've now created one up in New England. There's unfortunately been some uh, case law. There's a recent Supreme Court case that has potentially put a little bit of a damper on being able to prosecute for uh, opioid, for abusive opioid prescribers. Um, but, um, you know, you have to know what your trends are. So, you know, one of the last cases I worked for, I retired, involved a doctor who was a neurologist. She was the number two biller in the country for allergy testing and allergy shots. And but she's a neurologist. So that raises a red flag. But the other red flag in the data was something like 99 percent of her patients all went to one of three pharmacies. And so this was a strike force case. And the strike force lawyer said, hey, this doesn't make any sense. Why is it 99 percent of the patients are going to these three pharmacies? I think there's a kickback. And I spent the day doing some research. There really wasn't the all of the patients lived within a mile or so radius of the pharmacies. Uh, all of the pharmacies were dispensing the same three or four drugs. It just was a it was a, a convenience thing. The the allergy testing is another story. She actually wound up going to trial and getting convicted um, because she was uh, in cahoots with a lab that was doing some of the processing of the tests for her. She was getting a kickback and doing all of that. But it's important to understand these trends. The OENI and OAS studies come out frequently, and uh, as a result of them coming out. You know, you know what trends are because they're looking, right? So the one that just came out today on telemedicine talks about the trends in telemedicine and where investigative operations are going to be. And then the OIG work plan. When I started to work for Jean Marie Advised, one of the first things that she said was, oh, the work plan. How often did you look at the work plan when you were an agent? And I said, probably twice. The first time to learn what the work plan was, and then probably a week after I retired, figuring I probably have to look at the work plan. In, the, in OIG, Office of Investigations follows the fraud, not the work plan. The work plan isn't always about fraud. The work plan is actually about whether or not there are program weaknesses that need to be tightened up or if money was misappropriately spent for different things. It's not inherently about fraud. It's about whether or not, remember, the OIG's job is to monitor, among other things, CMS who oftentimes says thank you for your information and then there's nothing about it. But, but the OIG work plan is, is now focusing very hard on the things that they're looking at are retrospective looks that are taking a look at how data is showing them where to look. For example, the stuff on telemedicine now is entirely data driven. So this is an example of where when I talk about that part A, part B, where there's this kind of like um, meshing of the data. And, it's, and this is a little bit, it was an older case, but it really does kind of punctuate very simply the issue. It was a podiatrist who spent 90 plus percent or more of his working week going from senior citizen building to senior citizen building to senior citizen building, corralling people up in the community room clipping their toenails, and then sending them on their way. He was waiving the required copay from Medicare, which is 20%, unless you can demonstrate a financial hardship. It was really out of convenience is why he was doing it. But at the time, 
the the rule for doing a home visit defaulted to Medicare Part A's requirement for something called a home health benefit. And so you had to demonstrate medical necessity for the visit at that time. That it wasn't, you couldn't just do it for convenience. That you had to have a, med, you had to be able to document the medical record. Why is the patient, why am I treating this patient in their home when they could come to my office? And so I had this idea that I thought, if I can show what percentage of the patient population was getting a home health benefit, right? Because then there's a presumption that if you're getting a home health benefit, that they're considered homebound, not the same as bedbound, but homebound, that I could at least have some idea as to whether or not my theory on the allegation was correct, that this was out of convenience. I had video of him clipping people's toenails in the community room where it was really just a circus, you know, two minutes or three minutes. But this was a good way to empirically be able to demonstrate it. You can see in years 2001, two, three, and four, that only 10% of his patient population, so HIC, HIC stands for Health Insurance Claim. It's your Medicare number back then. It's now known as the Medicare Beneficiary ID or MBI. But at the time, it was the it was essentially your the number that was used for processing claims. And so, if you looked at the unique number of patients that he had in 2001, 2,267, and then of that, 234 patients were getting a home health benefit. So 10% of his patients were getting a home health benefit. And so it would be very hard for me to articulate that at least 10% of his patients probably wouldn't have qualified for a home visit. You know, you don't want to get crazy on trying to prove everything. You have to use a little bit of data. But so at least there's some, there's some fire where I see that there's smoke because he's clearly got 9% of his people are convenience services. And none of the other providers that um, these people were seeing were getting home visits. So they're going to their cardiologist, they're going to their other doctors, it was a convenience factor. And then you look in 2005, that number drops down to 5% because I arrested him and so he was out of business in 2005. And so uh, it's very hard to continue to provide services when you've been arrested. And so, um, and he ultimately pleaded guilty and, um, and did some jail time and paid back a lot of money because he was making billions of dollars by basically giving people pedicures. So in pharmacy space, it works similarly. You can run data, you can look at data, and you can identify instances where, for example, a pharmacy is billing for the name brand of a drug, but they're really putting the generic in the bottle. And you can look at that through inventory reconciliation. How is it that you buy, uh, uh, you buy three aspirin, but you build for a thousand aspirin, but you don't have it in your inventory. So inventory reconciliation comes to show that. So investigative life cycle. So if there's always a receipt of a complaint. Complaint comes into the OIG. It gets vetted by an agent. It gets vetted by somebody. Sometimes there's interviews that need to be done. You've got to talk to people. You've got to see is that complaint founded or unfounded? Is it a former employee? Is it assumed to be former employee? Is it someone who has a bone to pick? People that have a bone to pick, it doesn't necessarily mean they're wrong, right? They could be okay. Um, you know, a lot of times it could be it was okay for the fraud to be committed while you worked for the company, but the minute that they fired you, it suddenly became a problem. And you have to vet that out because you have to understand people for that. Tons of document reviews. When I was an agent, sometimes I would spend an entire week never leaving the office because I'm looking at bank records, I'm looking at medical records, I'm looking at policies, I'm looking at phone records, I'm looking at text messages. If a search warrant was done, then there's a whole bunch of stuff that you've got to look at, emails, uh, are a huge piece of it. And then documents that you get off of uh, various types of subpoenas that come in. So the OIG is looking at a case, you've got, to, like, what are the considerations? So I said there's only four or 500 agents. There's thousands of fraud cases that come in. And so a little bit of it is, what's the loss amount? Is it a diminished amount of money? Is it going back to the Medicare contractors to process uh, as an overpayment? Is the overpayment that's been calculated an actual overpayment? Is it a statistically valid random sample? And is that statistically valid random sample bringing you a large dollar amount that makes it worth your time and effort to investigate? Or is it uh, more productive to send this case back to the Medicare contractor to just treat as an overpayment because, the, because of case priorities. Cases that come to the OIG, to the strike force, or what's known as the HEAT, 
There's about 15 or 14 cities that run them. Uh, are those cases going to get priority? Key TAMs get priority, particularly if it's from a law firm that does these frequently. So you've got a little bit of a history, and those law firms tend to provide nothing but good cases. So they tend to get worked a little bit more. If the complainant is known, it's going to be looked at. If the complainant is unknown, you have no way to independently corroborate or verify the information that the person has told you. And so complaints that are from anonymous sources typically do not get a lot of traction unless that anonymous source is providing so much information that you can do the work without needing that person to begin with. Obviously, if there's a patient harm issue, so the most notable one was the doctor in Detroit, Dr. Uh, Fareed Fada. He was the guy that was doing chemotherapy on patients that didn't have cancer. And I think that case went three days before they were to, before they charged him. I think they got the complaint out of Detroit on a Thursday or Friday, and by Monday they had shut him down. So he was treating people claiming that they had cancer and providing them with chemotherapy when they did not have cancer. One of the side effects of that is you can get cancer and because your immune system gets suppressed. And so within three days, um, that case was adjudicated. So patient harm issues tend to take the number one precedence over everything. And then the individual prosecutor's office, like what's their priority? If it's an office like in New Jersey, we had a whole unit of um, prosecutors, assistant U.S. attorneys, who did nothing but health care fraud. Um, I had about an eight-year period where I had a cubicle at the U.S. Attorney's Office, and I sat outside of the chief of the unit's office. And so he worked every single case that I had because I sat there and just stared at him like a hungry cat. You're going to work this case, my man. You're going to work this case. Um, and so priorities are going to be some of those considerations as well. So let's talk about the alphabet soup of what they are. UPICs are the Unified Program Integrity Contractors. There are five of them. The UPICs are contracted organizations who are paid by CMS to manage benefit integrity on behalf of Medicare. So there are five of them. There's the Western UPIC, the Southwest UPIC, the Midwest UPIC, Northeast and Southeast. We advise, our, we're a subcontractor on two of those. So we do a lot of work in the UPIC space. We just hired the former, now former, director of the Northeast UPIC. He was an OIG guy who retired. He ran the UPIC. Now he works for us. Um, and so they do benefit integrity, meaning that they do prepay, meaning before you can get paid for a service, you have to submit your medical records, and they get audited or reviewed in that case, and then a determination is made as to whether or not it's going to be payable or not. Um, those are very time-consuming and costly, so nobody likes to put providers on prepay. Postpay is a retrospective review, meaning essentially a clawback. They're going to try to collect money back after that. The medic, which is the benefit integrity, it's the UPIC for Medicare Advantage and Part D, Medicare Part D. Part C and D, it, Part C is also known as Medicare Advantage. When Part C came out, it was called Part C because A and B were already taken, so it became C. And then Part D, which came about during um, during Bush uh, two in 2006, um, became the Prescription Drug Benefit Program. The original Prescription Drug Benefit did not uh, statute did not include the ability for uh, CMS or the government to negotiate prices. Uh, that is kind of an odd thing because every other government entity that purchases drugs, the VA, the Bureau of Prisons, Indian Health Services, which is a component of HHS, were able to all negotiate prices. But under Medicare, there was essentially a non-interference clause in the statute that said that the government can't interfere in the manner in which the Part D program actually ran. There's some broad statutory language on it, but that has changed with the recent legislation that was just passed um, through Congress and the Biden administration that allows for that negotiation. Now, it is not a great thing because it's not all drugs. It's only 125 drugs, and it's not all taking effect at the same time. It's a, it's a phased-in approach. You know, it's something like 20 drugs one year, 15 drugs another year, and it's in classifications of drugs. So one of the biggest things is insulin is now going to have a capped cost, but also out-of-pocket expenses are going to have a capped cost. So if you are a Medicare beneficiary and you have ten or $20,000 a year worth of prescription drugs, your costs are now going to be capped, which is a big thing. And then lastly, the MAP, which is the Medicare Administrative Contractors. Easiest way to describe that, those are the payers. Those are the organizations that are private, typically private payers as well. 
and they have contracts with Medicare to administer the day-to-day -day processing of claims, enrolling providers into the program, providing education and training. They do a bunch of audit-related work, and I will say that MACs do audits, and the UPICs do investigations. Anybody who thinks that a UPIC is doing an audit, they're doing it for the purposes of identifying fraud, waste, or abuse, whereas the MACs are sometimes doing it for the purposes of developing policy and what are called local coverage decisions or empirical studies to identify error rates within CMS's operations. Um, and so they have a little bit of a similar job, but the MACs' big role is enrolling people into the uh, providers in the program, paying the claims, providing training and education to providers who either need it or want it. So anytime an investigation is initiated by the government, the complaint that is leading to the initiation of that investigation may be unfounded, but you might have an entirely different case. You might be looking at a case involving, uh, for example, services not rendered, but you might find that the services were rendered, they were just upcoded, right? So you may have one thing that you've got as your complaint, but it may lead to something else. Anytime you talk to somebody, it's going to lead you to have to talk to somebody else because everybody's a piece of a puzzle. Nobody has all the answers. My favorite would be to go to an interview and they would say, well, I don't really know anything. Well, no, you don't know everything, but you know something, and it's a piece of the puzzle that you have to put together. And so interviews will always lead to interviews. And you know, once you start to talk to two or three or four people, they might say, well, I don't know anything about that, but did you talk to that person, and they may know something. So it's putting pieces together. Data analytics will always lead to more data analytics. You find an outlier on something, you have to sometimes get a little bit more granular, right? So if you find that a provider is billing for what's known as an impossible day, more hours in the day than there are, maybe you start to look at individual days and individual services, and so you have to get very granular. And that's part of, as a, on the provider side, that's a little bit of that revenue cycle Right? As a provider, you should know if you're billing for impossible days or not. Document reviews always lead to other document reviews. I would do a subpoena for bank records. Well, now I've discovered where their mortgage, where the mortgage is, the credit cards, cell phone, all of those things. So there's more subpoenas that would have to be issued as a result of that. And in any criminal investigation, the goal of a criminal investigation is the prosecution of the person who's committed the malfeasance. One of the tools that are used in law enforcement is the search warrant. And the discussion, you know, and I'm not picking, mean, this is totally apolitical, but when you see things like the photographs of the alleged uh, top secret documents sprawled out, they clearly were not found that way. But when law enforcement goes and starts taking photographs of everything at a search warrant, you have to take photographs of what they're not showing you are going to be the photographs of how those documents were found. There's going to be photographs of that. When we would go do a search warrant, everything in the place that you're searching gets labeled. Every room gets a label. Every desk, every chair, every lap, everything is labeled. And the documentation shows you, if, I, if I'm looking at a piece of paper and it was in room A, 1B, I can go back to A, 1B and know exactly where it came from. And so it's a little misleading to say that those documents, that picture is just a representative picture. But the goal of any sort of law enforcement operation is the prosecution and adjudication criminally of the person who committed the crime. And so search warrants are a tool for that. By the time law enforcement actually physically shows up to do a search warrant, there, there may have actually been three or four electronic search warrants that you never know about. In the healthcare world, electronic medical record systems are in the cloud. You can do a search warrant on the provider of that service, and you will never know about it. So your electronic medical record system is, may have been searched, right? Um, there could be email search warrants. Uh, Amazon Web Services, AWS, or Microsoft Azure, you can execute search warrants on those things and get that data. So that by the time you physically get to the building that you're looking to search, you're taking very little because most of what you've needed to take, you've already gotten in an electronic format. We would do search warrants back in the mid-90s when I started where we would show up with a truck and a hand truck and we would take out file cabinets of things. Now you go and do a search warrant, you leave with three or four boxes and a whole bunch of hard drives because there's not that much physical paper anymore. 
But search warrants are a, a legitimate law enforcement tool. Judges sign off on the search warrant after making an objective assessment of the facts presented in what's known as the affidavit. And everybody's now getting their criminal justice degree and getting their Google law degree from what's going on today in the world. But you know, these are legitimate tools that are, that are out there. So a couple of compliance considerations as we, as we wrap up. So one, for those of you that are working, and it doesn't matter if you're in a practice, a healthcare practice, if you're in industry, if you're in a corporate setting, none of these things change. So the first thing is, is there a policy in place on how you're going to deal with instances of law enforcement attempts to interview current employees? Now, you can't tell your employees, no, you can't speak to law enforcement, right? But law enforcement just because law enforcement shows up at your door doesn't mean you have to speak to them. You can say, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. And whatever happens, happens. But you can say, no, thank you. I'm really not interested in speaking to you today and kind of leave it at that, right? Is, is there a policy if law enforcement shows up with a search warrant? Some of the worst scenarios that I ever encountered were showing up to a search warrant after the business opened and the first person that law enforcement interacts with is who? The receptionist. The receptionist. The receptionist is on the scale of where they're paid and their level of responsibility. They're sort of at the bottom, right? Sort of at the bottom. So law enforcement shows up with a, to execute a search warrant. When law enforcement shows up, yes, there's badges, there's guns, there's bullet resistant vests. Why? Because when I show up, I don't know who everybody is. I've taken guns off of people who illegally possess them during search warrants. Right? So these things happen. People have criminal histories. You don't know everybody in the room. And so you, you get there, and the person that you're interacting with is a 19-year-old high school graduate who's just trying to make their way in life, and now you have to deal with them. I had one search warrant where we were in the middle of doing the search warrant. The doctor showed up at the office, saw that we were there, and left. Just turned around and left. Turned around, turned around, and left. So what's the policy if law enforcement shows up? The 19-year-old that's at the front desk shouldn't be the person that you have to deal with. It's the worst position that you're putting everybody in. And then, you know, what's the policy if subpoenas are served? So there's typically something called a litigation hold, and lawyers will get involved. Litigation hold, everything from this day forward, you know, it, we're preserving it. Don't destroy things. Don't manipulate things. But is there a policy in place that if somebody shows up with a subpoena, where does it go? Right? So contrary to popular belief, you don't have to sign for a subpoena. If I was to show up with a subpoena and go to hand it to you and you go, well, I'm not taking that subpoena, and I just put it on your desk, it doesn't matter. That subpoena has been served properly. And then just kind of to bring it home, what are some other compliance considerations for the business, right? So the number one thing is, what's, do you have a policy on proactive data analytics? For billing trends, are you looking at from a revenue cycle perspective? Are you looking at from a business perspective, right? So in the pharma industry, the sales reps all get scorecards. They know who their docs are. They know who's prescribing. They, you know, it's those analytics because it really doesn't matter if it's a if it's a solo practitioner who is you know just an internal medicine doctor or it's big pharma, right? It's big pharma. You have to know: Are you in the coupon and copay world? Are you processing coupons and copays uh, and waiving them through through card processes in which you haven't vetted out that that person is or isn't covered by a government payer, right? So I'm doing a project right now with a pharmacy who got themselves in a pickle in part because of that. And one of the biggest issues that they had was there was specialty pharmacy and they were getting their prescriptions routed through what's called a hub, and we won't go into what a hub is, but they were relying upon the hub's vetting. Mm -hmm. And when they were calling the patient to arrange for delivery of the drug and confirming the address, the one question that they never asked, that they should have asked is, is your insurance information as I sit here today correct? And are you covered? Is this insurance a Part D program or a Medicaid program or whatever? Because the card doesn't tell you that. The card doesn't say Medicare Part D or Medicaid. If they had asked that question and that one question, they probably would have not gotten themselves in the pickle that they did because they were actually, at the end of the day, relying upon a data set 
that was downloaded once a year from CMS. That's a spreadsheet of what they call bins and PCNs, which is not accurate. CMS doesn't even know all of the PBMs out there. Now, there are companies that do that. I do some consulting outside of advice for a company that works in that space. And there are some other companies that are out there that do that as well. And so that to me is that's the way you help to bulletproof yourself. If you're in the pharma industry and you're not uh, connected up with one of these vendors that do this, that can give you a 98 or 99 percent confidence level, that's a compliance failure. But your billing data is going to help you with understanding that. And so it's important that you understand where your data is, what's your policy on looking at your data, right? Everybody's looking at data, you should be looking at your data as well. If you're an outlier and it's okay to be an outlier, understand why you're an outlier. Electronic record retention, if you're a licensed healthcare provider, it defaults to state regulation. It's typically somewhere in the six or seven year range from the last date of service. It doesn't mean that you need to keep the person's record when they were two years old and they're now 40 and you've got like a truck to bring out like that. But it's from the last, it's seven years uh, of retention, six years in some place. It is very important to review the DOJ and the OIG's compliance guidance. They're the same, but they're different. Mm -hmm. The OIG's compliance guidance is what to do proactively to not get in trouble. The DOJ's is what to do once you've gotten in trouble because one of them talks about corporate cooperation, one talks about corporate responsibility. So a little bit different, but very similar. If you've got contracts or subcontracts for um, in the healthcare space, you've got to be very cognizant of the anti-kickback statute and start. If you have people that work for you that are 1099 sales reps, the OIG has opined that that is a de facto violation of the anti-kickback statute. So some of the small pharma companies that are out there, they use contracted sales staff that is a problem. You've got to be very careful about that. You've got to have contracts that are very well structured, that it is not in a sales rep's financial interest because you don't want them to become a fiduciary where it's in their interest to refer as much work as they possibly can. If you've got exclusions, you should be doing those checks. The OIG says that you should be uh, checking the exclusions database when someone gets hired and at a regular interval after or something along those lines. It's a very like open-ended thing. I always say you should be checking for excluded individuals and even people through your downstream vendors. If you're not checking them and you have what's known as the business associate agreement under HIPAA, you're responsible for their action. So if you're using a downstream company for anything, you should be ensuring that they're doing exclusion checks. I say you should do it every month. If you have somebody that you hire in January and you check exclusions and they're not there and they get convicted of something in February and they get excluded in March, which never happens, it happens years later, but if for some strange reason the OIG actually did what it's supposed to do and they, and they got excluded by March, but you don't check them again until January of the following year, you're on the hook for nine months of them being excluded and you billing for them. So you've got to check every month because that's the only way you're going to be able to limit your exposure. At the end of the day, it's a, when a claim is submitted under an excluded individual, it's new or should have known, you're on the hook for it. You can't say, well, uh, you know, I absolve myself of the responsibility because I checked once a year. So you can't, you can't do that. Coders and auditors, for those of you that do coding and auditing, you can be part of the problem as well. And I don't want to make too big of a deal out of it, but coders and auditors who are complicit in the perpetuation of fraud are part of that, right? Coders and auditors are like the first line of defense. Now, most of the coders and auditors I know are like, forget black and white, but they are like, it's very black, it's very white, there's no gray. So coders and auditors can be part of this. And so, you know, um, they're the group that I would go to first. If I had a problem on a case, and I knew that I had that there was a coding and billing company. I would go and say, "Did you have conversations with the provider about this?" You tell them not to do it. And then finally, because now we're out of time, here's my contact information. Uh, if you're not connected with me on LinkedIn, I do ask, encourage you join LinkedIn uh, with me. Let's connect up. Uh, we put our podcasts up. I, I'm on LinkedIn constantly, but this is the way to get hold of us here at Advise. Thanks so much. Uh, apparently, your uh, your turkey sandwich on white with mayo is sitting, uh, and your very small apple 
uh, because now that school has started, you've only got to eat an apple and uh, there'll be a small juice and uh, cheese crackers. Thanks very much. Uh, what, oh, quick question. I seem to remember that there's a place that you can look up uh, whether it's your provider has uh, been accused of fraudulent juice. Is there a you, website? Or you can't go to a website to identify where someone has been accused of something because an accusation because an, an, an accusation, you can find if they've been prosecuted, charged, there'll be a press release, but there's nothing about if someone's been just merely accused of fraud. I'm sorry, I misspoke, but if they have been prosecuted for it. So if they've been criminally prosecuted, they will eventually turn up on the list of excluded individuals and entities, which is the OIG's website, okay. the L-E-I-E okay. list of entities and individuals that are excluded. Um, other than that, you can Google and find all kinds of stuff that way, too. Yeah. Yeah. We'll make Sean jealous. Oh, hey, we're mutants. Yeah, cool. Absolutely. As long as, as long as there's no butt touch there. Do you guys like it? So let's try. Let's try. I'll edit Sean in this one. I'll put him on the caricature himself. Yeah, sure. uh -huh. yeah NPC, so yeah.